So I'm going to turn this over to you and let you get started to introduce us because this is the customer experience. And what Lisa and I are going to do is sort of talk back and forth about how data affects something that's so important to our lives. Absolutely. And Theresa is my, my partner in crime of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm bringing the non-technical perspective and then she's coming in and is hopefully what you'll see in this session is I'm going to set up a little bit of, of things that are really impacting um, humans and then we're going to show you some some ways to address that. But you know, first I just want to like that that whole shark thing was awesome. And even though we didn't actually see them, it was really cool to see the the video and to hear all about that. And you know, a little bit of what I'm going to talk about today, it's a little bit of a pivot. But you know, one of the things you'll see is I'm going to talk about some trends and that concept of conservation in consumers is, is one of the trends that I'm, I'm going to be talking about. You wanna go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So I, I just wanna step back and, you know, we've all, you know, I'm not gonna talk about 2020 was an unprecedented year. We've heard that it's an understatement, but there were, you know, all of these seismic shifts from work and personal health, social and political environment. And on Earth Day, you know, definitely that concern for the environment, you know, around us, anxiety and uncertainty really became this global shared experience. And it had a profound impact on customers and what their expectation is of the companies that they are interacting with. Um, and in fact, while emotional sentiment has always been something that brands are considering when they think about interacting with their customers, this past year um, and, and continuing into this year, that's really become front and center. In fact, according to Forrester, emotion has become the most important dimension of customer experience quality. And this spans industries, right? So this is not, we're not just talking about retail, we're talking about banking, we're talking about manufacturing. So we're talking about customers, employees, B2B. It's really important that, that everybody is in a different emotional place, I think, than they were certainly a year ago. And that heightened emotional factor combined with that increasing understanding by the average person on the street as to how companies are targeting them and using their data has led to a real shift in how customer experience and marketing professionals need to think about our jobs. And again, across industries, because we need to think about what are the trends, what, what the, this last year and this change and this idea that people are expecting to interact with companies in a completely different way. What is that really driving? So for the purposes of our conversation, I wanna focus in on sort of three key trends that we've seen. Uh, I'm, and I'm gonna talk about the trust paradox, the social brand and consumption backlash. And again, that consumption backlash is actually very relevant to where we ended our conversation with the, the shark experts. So, you know, just briefly, I want to go into each of these and talk a little bit about what they are. So starting there with that trust paradox, trust has taken a real beating this year. Um, you know, consumers have become very savvy to the ways that they're being manipulated and they're not happy about it. And I think um, a lot of documentary filmmakers, there's quite a few interesting things now um, out on Netflix. Um, Coded bias is one of them. The social dilemma is another one. People are becoming super aware of how brands are in some ways, you know, I hate to say manipulating them, but they've become very suspicious that brands are manipulating them with data. And so to succeed with this new, um, more cynical customer, brands are really going to have to um, walk a very fine line between predicting what a customer wants based on their data and those algorithms and leveraging that same data to manipulate them. It's gonna be a super fine line because you wanna cross sell and upsell. And again, that is very important, whether you're talking about a financial product or a physical product, right? Whatever, any industry, when you're interacting with your customers, you want to know them, right? You wanna serve them up the content that they know and you want to get that next best action in there but you really don't wanna to, want to manipulate them. And this means focusing on transparency, security, and ethical design at every step 
of the, uh, of the customer interaction in every part of your organization. So trust is a critical value driver. So according to Forbes, 79% of consumers will not do business with the company if they think they can't trust them with their data, regardless of how valuable that product or service is. And they've also become cynical with fewer than half of all consumers believing that any company is capable of using their data in an ethical manner. And so this really leaves brands walking that tightrope. And we've done even just a few years ago, and there's research that we've done in the last couple of years, we've seen that customers, and in particular, I was part of a study a year and a half ago on financial services products, customers want you to use their data. They want you, they expect that you know them and you're gonna serve them up what they want, but you've gotta walk that fine line. And that's where transparency really comes in because we, you, you need to serve up the data, but you need to let them know how, how you're doing that. So you've got, Lisa, you've got us walking an incredible tightrope here because at the same time, we've got these oceans of data that are gonna make artificial intelligence possible for us. You're Telling us that our customers don't trust us using that data. So, you know, what are you seeing companies really doing about that dilemma? Yeah, so this has been a huge one for my team because I lead the customer experience team. So our whole, I lead the customer experience team for NTT data, right? So our entire reason for being is to help navigate, right, that, that fine line. So you really have to recognize what is meant by transparency because transparency and trust is really important. And you have to understand why transparency is important. So quite simply, transparency is good branding. And that's what companies have to start to, to recognize. You should be doing nothing with your customer data that you aren't okay with them knowing of. In fact, I would go so far, sort of a litmus test that, that we use a little bit is to think about all the ways you're using your customer data to serve up products to them. If the New York Times found out about it and put it on a headline, would you be okay? Would your customers be okay, right? And I think if we said, hey, we're using customer data because we want to actually understand where they are and what they're trying to do so we can find the right mortgage for them, right? That's a, you know, a quick example. We wanna be able to give them, serve them up the right product or suite of products or the right insurance suite of products or whatever that suite of products is. I think we'd be okay if everybody knew about that. And so what that <laughs> means is that you really have to think about what your gain is and you have to really focus on lifetime loyalty versus short-term gain because often, if there's a way that you're using the customer data that you maybe were like, oh, maybe they won't be okay with that, that is typically because there's some short-term gain that you're trying to do. But if you look at, at lifetime loyalty, you can really think about recognizing that mutual value proposition of we're gonna use your data because there's mutual value to us to, to push it back out to you. And we're, we're going to use your data over time. So we're not gonna try to get all of your information all at once so we can hammer you with offers, right? We're gonna recognize that it's gonna be right offer at the right time based on what the customer's actually trying to do. The second thing is really around recognizing security as a core customer value. So you're gonna take security protocol seriously at every customer touch point. So, so, so moving on from that, and you know, thanks Teresa, because that was a, um, a good question. You know, let's talk about that second one. And that second one is around social brand. Um, you know, we're, we're quickly finding that there's no sideline here, thanks to Twitter and social media. And if you noticed, um, you know, even in the last year with a lot of the social upheaval, an EY study showed that those that, that COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement increased value-based spending in the US. So customers only wanna do business with companies that they feel they're connected to in some way. And it's called solidarity spending. And we've really seen it become a global trend, right? So we've got surveys out there showing that people are more likely to do business with brands who support a social issue that they align. What was interesting is the Zero Trust Group found that consumers are four times more likely to do a business with a company who has a clearly defined purpose, regardless of what that purpose might be. So this isn't just a matter of you need to pretend you care about the same thing that your customers care about. You need to genuinely show 
that you care about something and make that part of your branding and customers will start to feel better and they're starting to align themselves more around this social brand. Well, you know, Lisa, that takes a lot of something that we call sentiment tracking. Yeah, absolutely. Tracking is really hard to do, especially if you're like Coca-Cola or Delta. All of a sudden, which how are you tracking that kind of sentiment? Because there's got to be people on both sides of that equation. Oh, for sure. And, you've, and, and those are two great examples because they've been in the headlines, right, of trying to, to, to ride this line of, of letting their customers know what they think is right and wrong. So, you know, here at NTT Data, we are leveraging a, a combination of social listening tools, sentiment analysis, and actionable dashboards to sort of go beyond marketing. So everybody's doing, you know, most brands are doing that sort of marketing sentiment analysis to help, help them make decisions, right? We're looking beyond just how do customers think about your product? And we're looking at how do your customers think and what is their attitude about you in context of how they think? You know, so if you think about uh, companies making decisions, how to reopen and do business, we actually used this tool that we have with the city of Plano, who's one of our, our clients, to help the mayor of the city understand the sentiment of his constituents, help the mayor of the city understand how his constituents felt about reopening and about decisions that he as mayor had made, which then fed into how he made decisions. So this, this tool, this social media listening and sentiment analysis tool that we have, where we had before been using it from a sales perspective, are now really focusing it around um, that social brand idea and how customers can, again, walk, or how our clients can walk that line. Very good. And then that last one here that, that I want to talk about um, before we talk about some of the data, some of the tools that you can use to, to address this is around that consumption backlash. And this one really um, segues great from what we were talking about with, with the shark conference. Uh, uh, conservation, because despite increased optimism in the economy, we do recognize that COVID-19 in particular, and then also some of the, the you know, the dire um, predictions that we're hearing about, about, you know, about global warming and climate change, customers are really starting to be a lot more mindful about how they spend their money. So there, there's an increased eye towards sustainability and really focus on needs-based purchasing. So, so a lot of, you know, fast fashion is one industry really being impacted by this. Mm -hmm. Customers are really starting to look at how do I buy fewer, but higher quality, possibly more expensive, but higher quality uh, items so that there is this, um, this, this sort of retraction away from conspicuous consumption due to these environmental concerns and much more towards just the things that I need that are higher quality, which means products and services that we sell to our customers really need to count. We need to, we need to understand value propositions like never before. So talk about that a little bit, because if we're, if we're in this consuming and growth, that's growth means consumption. And right. so now all of a sudden you're telling us that people are going to buy fewer things and they're going to be higher quality. What's the impact on the industry overall for that kind of a shift? Yeah, so that, that's interesting because often when I talk about this with, with clients, they think, oh, that's a retail industry problem, right? Um, because that immediate impact is the retail industry. But really, the impact goes way beyond, beyond that because if you think the retail industry is actually part of a very long um, you know, supply chain and value chain. So we're looking at everything from the manufacturers at the beginning of the supply chain all the way through to the financial services industries where these companies are um, you know taking out loans starting new businesses all, all of these things so every industry is really being impacted by this you know and it may not be less consumption it's consumption of, of less disposable things. Mm -hmm. So the key will be for every step in that supply chain to have a heightened understanding of your customer and the end customer. So if you think about that beyond retail for manufacturing, this means knowing what their buyer goals are. And for the buyers of the manufacturing products that actually ultimately get sold, it's also knowing you know, what that end customer's goal. So you're thinking every step of the way, what is my buyer goal? 
right? What is their customer's goal? And what's that ultimate end customer's goal? And how can we all sort of come together to think from a, from a supply chain perspective, how are we reducing our footprint so that when customers buy that product, they're looking all the way back to where it was manufactured and how it was funded to decide whether or not they wanna buy the product. So it's really about rethinking your success metrics and getting real time with your data. Very you know, yeah, and I, I would say, and, and Teresa, I think this would probably be an excellent time to, to segue over to you because I'm telling you, oh, you know, rethink your success metrics and we can definitely do that. But I'm talking about getting real time with your data. And speaking of that, you know, Teresa, I know you're having a lot of conversations with our clients about their customer data. H how are those conversations going? What are the challenges they're coming to you with? And, and how are we addressing that? Well, first of all, the, the data that our customers are accumulating is being used in exactly what you're talking about because they are looking at improving the customer experience. That's the number one thing they want to do. But they're also looking at how they can use it in a variety of ways. Everything from the back office to the front office, which is what you're talking about when you talk about customer and employee experience, because those go hand in hand. In fact, one of the analysts that we deal with talks about one office where it's not front or back anymore. It's one consolidated view. And with that, you get a lot of data that you have to process you get it in a lot of places too. And what we're finding is that we have data all over the place. And what we need to do in order to provide AI with an ocean to swim in is to put it in a place where it can be, it can be curated, it can be managed, and it can be collected in an unbiased manner, which is one of the things that you and I've talked about before is how do yeah. we actually collect information that makes sense for people and that doesn't leave out sections of our population or slant the results one way or the other. So that's a really big thing for us nowadays. But we're also starting to use um, what we're calling our data with creating digital humans. In other words, yeah, the pandemic sort of put us at a loss as how we connect with people and on a human basis. We do it over Zoom. Uh, well, if you're doing it over Zoom, you might as well create something that's a digitized environment to help you do that. And so we've created some experiences using data that involve a digital human. And we've got a couple of places where we have shown this. For example, at Kia Motors, we introduced a, uh, an avatar at the airport kiosk. And that airport kiosk went from there to the showroom of Kia, predominantly to explain the, electrical, the electric vehicle, which no one in Kia's uh, showroom staff could really explain. So it was a perfect opportunity to have someone, ex to have a digital human explain it. We also have been experimenting with MIT on the remote learning assistant, which is an ability for us to keep kids engaged with uh, products, with reading or with math, and where the digit, where the character, which is really kind of a an electronic or version of a cartoon, actually engages with the student. And then finally, uh, we've looked at some at retail and what we can do with retail, because that was one of the things you talked about, Lisa, is we, want, we wanted to see if we could develop a human, a digital human, that was more than just a answer the question kind of human, but was a human that could solve a problem. And so we have a, a project that we're going to show you here in a second, a video that's just a clip of what we have done in order to create that digital human. And I am hoping that this works. These are, by the way, available on YouTube if uh, you guys can see them. Good morning. How can I help you today? I need to pay my bill, but I don't understand why it's higher than last month. Oh, I can help you with that. My name is Vera. What's yours? My name is Torsten. Hi, 
Torsten, I hope you're having a nice day today. For account security, I need to verify some information. Please tell me your cell phone number. My number is 908-347-5500. Aha, please also tell me your billing zip code. 08822. Okay, thanks. I will now look up your bill. So Torsten, I see that you have three phones on this account. You're the primary account owner. What about your bill do you find unclear? My data usage charge has gone up by 100% since last month. What's causing that? Hmm, let's look at your bill. I see that the phone with the number ending in 9999 has exceeded your monthly data plan. That's what's causing the increase in your current bill. I see. We just gave a new iPhone to my 10-year-old. How can I prevent this from happening in the future? Got it. I can help you with that. We offer a parenting app that allows you to manage your family's call and text and can block content and set data limits. Would you like me to add this protection to your plan? Yes, please do that. What you see here in this demonstration is that the avatar is reacting to the person when, she, when he walks up, she asks his name and she introduces herself. The other thing is, is that she takes the input from the human in whatever form he's giving it. When he says double O instead of zero zero, she knows exactly what that means. And she goes through and tries to solve the problem, offering up capabilities that are very prominent in, a, uh, in an exercise like this. So I'm gonna go back to this now. Are there, I, I'll stop for just a second. Are there any questions about anything that you've seen in the digital human area here? So Theresa, we do have, there is one question about digital twins. So I think somebody's gonna wanna get to that. Um, right. You know, there is, there is a, you know, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, it looked like she was remembering things, right? Yeah, so so there's exactly. that sort of interaction that feels yeah. like perhaps, you know, she knew the customer when he came up. Yeah, that is one of the things that we've concentrated on in building this particular digital human is that we've tried to give her all of the emotions of a human being. And that means her sight, her voice, her emotion, because you notice she kicks her, her hair around a little bit when he responds a little negatively, her hearing, what she hears from the customer, and most importantly, her memory. And here's a great example. When we looked at Mia at the Kia uh, showroom, we wanted the Mia that was introduced at the airport. If she met someone that was that went from the airport to a showroom, we wanted her to be able to recognize that person. And ultimately, Kia would like to be able to have that avatar put into the car purchased by the person who came to the showroom, who saw it for the first time at the airport, so that there's a continuity to the customer experience or the customer engagement. And this is really sort of important part of what we're talking about, because this particular digital human is a little bit more than an Alexa. Alexa answers questions for you. She, she you know, I, I'm worried about saying that because if I say it to mm -hmm. her, actually answer the question I have. But she answers questions. What we're trying to do is to build a digital human platform that answers problems and solves problems for customers. And Can you talk a little bit about what's behind that? Because I, that, that yeah. to me is fascinating because a lot of people talk about it, but how are we actually doing it? Yeah. And, and you know what's really interesting? And I don't think this could be done anywhere else in the world but NTT data. I really don't. It's because we are so good at putting the pieces together to make a whole. And we, didn't, we don't do everything in this digital human. We borrow from a lot of different places. We borrow from the third party gaming and movie industry for how our graphics get rendered and how our people look. And for on-premise or cloud-based GPUs, we are dependent upon other people's technologies. 
We have third-party AI platforms that we look at. In, in other words, some of the stuff that we've done for voice-to-text is actually Google's. And it is some of the things that Alexa, that are behind Alexa. But built into that are also some of our NTT intellectual property, which deals with sentient audio and video analysis. And we ha actually have a custom microphone. I don't know if you could hear it on this particular video, but when this was recorded, there is someone in the room walking in high heels. And that would normally disturb an avatar because they would pick up on everything. But instead, she stays focused on the person that she's engaging with. So we combine all of that to make a digital human that we think is something that is unique in the industry. So Teresa, we do have a question about that. Um, and, and is what is the time period needed to have a fully functional digital human technology based on the different industry requirements? And I will caveat there to say, I think we should probably talk about fully functional because we typically recommend yeah. you start with a pilot. But do you want to talk about that example that we just showed and how quickly we, we, were, we would be able to stand up a pilot like that? Actually, we, um, we've stood up. The paperwork to do it is longer than doing it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> And just tell I, I can part. second that. Yes, it is. Uh, so <laughs> it is not, it is, the platform is there. It's managing the platform. But the real problem is getting the customer's data to back up the digital human in a way where it can be accessed. So if your data is already available and you think you've got it, or more importantly, here's something. If you've got a few chatbots that have already been deployed doing things, we can look at those, take those into consideration and look at the digital human and how they would manage in a chatbot environment to begin with. And then we would add capability going forward. But this is a given, this is a, an exercise in how we do this together, how we co-innovate with our customers, because not every industry, we're not gonna just plop something down in one place, pick it up and put it into another place. We want it to be unique and different. And as you said, Lisa, time and time again, it has to be a human experience. And every business carries with it the human element that they want to convey. Yeah, absolutely. And we bring accelerators to it. So the, the idea of even standing up you know, something um, very quickly in the matter of a week or two, something that looks like your brand, then the matter to Teresa's point is then getting that, that the data connected in is how it becomes really active. The data connection behind it is probably yeah. the thing that takes the longest. And Absolutely. it's early because the connections aren't there. Like you said, we do have accelerators for that, but it's the state of the data. And one of the things that we find is that when, when companies get to starting talking about digital humans, the data that they've accumulated often is not adequate for fueling a human, you know, and they have to they have to collect anew. They have to collect uh, audio with engagements with their customers that they might not have saved, you know, or they have to collect video analysis in some way to make sure that we can make our algorithms work. Great. So, so I want to pick up on a question as we do the, this transition, because um, Srinivas had asked earlier, how do you measure CX or retain customers and prove loyalty in this crazy environment using data and AI, which is a great segue into digital twin. But can you talk a little bit about the difference between digital human and digital twin? And then maybe talk a little bit about how we can use digital twin to do exactly what Srinivas had asked. Yeah, we, I think to start with, and although this one talks about digital human first and then digital twin on this chart, really you have to talk about a digital twin. And you, Lisa, who've dealt with the internet and digital your entire life, know that basically a digital twin is nothing but a web agent that has to act on the web in a certain way and can mimic information that is in some other place at some other time. What we're talking about with the digital twin often is the simulation of something that is physical in a digital world. So digital twins became very popular in manufacturing 
where I could manage a motor on a manufacturing line by digitizing that motor and finding out how to, which toggles I needed to switch in order to make it work for a new manufacturing line. And if I could do that digitally, removed from the manufacturing floor, then it was more efficient. So with Digital Twin, though, what we have started to see is that's a great way for moving information and data around different places within the organization. And guess what? One of those places we have to move that information to is a digital human at a touch point, at a place where a customer is actually interacting either with some a representative of your company, an employee, or some other uh, physical person. So the digital human is just a representation of a human at that point using digital twin technology to get it in the right place and to manage it. it data has incredible experience in R&D with digital twin. One of the things that is unique about what we've been doing is that we're digitizing not just things, but we're digitizing the processes that things operate in as well. And for example, one of the, the projects that we're spending $230 million on this year alone is the project to digitize the human body. And specifically, we started with the heart and the lungs and the pulmonary system. So we're digitizing the process in the system, the pulmonary system, but also the things like the heart and the lungs and how they respond in that process. The goal is that by 2032 to 35, we will have digitized the entire human body and all its organs so that we can begin to test things like drugs with digitized versions of human beings instead of 42,000 real human beings who have to be given COVID vaccines. We can do it digitally. So Teresa, along those lines, is it fair to say also we could take customer sentiment analysis and customer segmentation data and create personas that are digital twins that we could use to even test concepts out before you launch a digital platform. Yes, that's exactly, that is exactly what your team and I have been talking about. <laughs> demo to do exactly what you just said. So that we don't spend millions on marketing or testing an A-B test. We actually know before we launch in real time, whether it's gonna work with the customers or not. Yep. So I think, how are we doing on time? I think we're doing pretty good. Yeah, you've got like 12 minutes. Our admin, how are we doing? You have about 12 minutes, you're doing great. Great. Well, why don't we take questions from the, the audience? Because Lisa and I could talk all day long about yeah. this. Oh, sure. So everybody, if you want to, please come off mute, um, come off camera, ask these very intelligent, highly informed ladies <laughs> questions. And we certainly, you know, we, we kind of went through quickly hoping we could have a dialogue. So if you have any questions about um, either the technology side and, and wanting to see more about digital human, wanting to see more about digital twin, if you have, you know, one thing I guess maybe is I would put it out there you know, thinking about even the trends I'm seeing, are there use cases that you have or a challenge that you have that any of this has sparked an idea of where it might apply? So, okay, I have a question. I know I'm just the admin, but I'm really excited. This is so cool. So um, I work a lot in my other million jobs that I've got with um, a lot of national parks and museums and, and, and uh, societies. So would something like the digital twin where you can replicate, um, you know, people past who have passed on in mm -hmm. like at a historical site, or I know that the Holocaust Museum has been working with some sort of kind of holographic something similar to replicate since all the Holocaust survivors are now um, passing on. So to preserve those, those yeah. uh, people, they are trying to start doing something similar. Like, the, is that something similar or am I totally off? No, that's, that's in some ways, that's exactly right. Um, I think the closest one that I've seen, though, to the digital human is William Shatner. William Shatner is 90, 92 years old, I believe, I and so, yeah. he started a project where he is recording answers to every question he's ever been asked. 
And so he is trying to create a digitized version of himself for when he's gone so that people can ask questions of Star Trek or whatever it is for as long as, as that is around. Which I think is kind of an interesting, different way of immortalizing yourself. It is. I, you know, and I have to, you know, since we have time, I don't, know, I don't know if there are any Black Mirror fans here, but there was a Black Mirror fan uh, uh, episode specifically around somebody, a woman whose husband died and, and she could not let go of this avatar and she ended up keeping him in her attic. It was kind of strange. <laughs> So we'll try not to go there. <laughs> there is this, you can get way out there. <laughs> um, I think along these lines, so Vani asks um, if we see digital humans playing a role in healthcare, especially in a telemedicine setting. And I say, absolutely. Theresa, you want to talk any about that? Absolutely. Right. In fact, we have with the uh, NTT disruption, there is a project right now going on with Jibo, which is sort of a, a little creature that we bought from MIT. And that particular uh, device, I guess, or that particular little thing is being deployed in children's hospitals specifically to talk to children, because what they found is that children sometimes don't tell the doctor everything. They don't know what th certain things mean, and that this particular device can get information out of them that the doctors can use. They're also finding that Jibo is very helpful in um, rest homes with older adults mm -hmm. who oftentimes the same way as children, don't get a chance to tell someone exactly what they're feeling. And it's been a real, it's a really interesting uh, exercise that they're doing with MIT. I think that the Jibo example is a, is, a, is a great time to point out, and we didn't go into the Lego example, but the digital human doesn't have to look like a human, right? So we showed you the one example of Vera where she does, but in this, this case, we can, that, that same technology can create a, a, an, a, an emotional connection with a robot, with a cartoon character, you know, so it's really unlimited how you can, how you can do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in healthcare, there's lots of opportunities, especially now that doctors have seen what the value of telemedicine is. So imagine if Vera was a doctor and had all of the capability of a doctor. You know, there's a lot of liability and a lot of issues associated with that. But think about that fact is you could actually have telemedicine delivered in a way by almost a human. So, um, you know, one thing uh, Anitha had asked, is there data on customer experience post implementation of digital humans? That's a little bit of a, of a, a double edged sword because this level of digital human that we're talking about has not been what we would say in the wild for that long. I, there is definitely data, data from Kia and I'd be happy to pull that and see if we can share yeah. that. But one of the things we're seeing is that um, to date, prior to this technology that we shared with you, the concept of digital humans has not been well executed. We've all had frustrating times with a bad IVR, for example. Um, so it's a little bit challenging, but one of our focuses, and again, we'd love to talk to, to, to any of you here, is we really want to run more pilots with this because the more pilots that we can run and we're, we're in the process with a few now, the more we can pilot this out and get that data, the more we can help you build up that business case for then implementing this more broadly in your organization. Absolutely, absolutely. So we, you're, the pilots that we run and we have done some, just so you know, uh, the creators in the AI team that put this together did some analysis with customers as to whether they would, how they would react to an avatar, because they were afraid that certain segments of the market would not re react well. Older people, they didn't think would work as well as younger people would, for example. What they found was that across the, across the spectrum, there was no real difference in how people reacted. And in most cases, all people cared about was getting the answer and the help they needed. Yep. Didn't really care who provided it. So um, that's one of the things that we're starting to look at. I have, however, presented this to um, executives who say, 
well, you know, the human touch has got to be there. And, you know, they're right. Maybe, you know, coming in close contact with the human is an important thing in certain industries. But consider that the people that have to support your customers in human face-to-face interactions could be just as well supported by an avatar as by another human. So it's not necessarily always customer facing that we have to do with these. We could do them with our employees as well. Yeah, Teresa, and that also brings up another point, which is, you know, why my team works with your team and you and I work so closely together, because this isn't just a technology implementation. So a very important part of even identifying what the POC or the use case should be is to work with my team to say, okay, what's that customer journey? Because you really need to understand at what point is the digital human appropriate and how do you know when you need to hand off to a human? And you, you, we, uh, further along in that demo that, that Teresa showed you a little piece of is that point where it gets to the point where it's time to talk to a person. So you can look at digital human if you look at it in the customer journey to know, okay, this is the point where we use it. Perhaps it's a concierge. These are the triggering factors. This is how the handoff to the human happens. And then this is how the digital human can then support that human. And I like to use the Iron Man metaphor, right? Then it becomes Jarvis to your your employee. Um, That's why it's really important to not just launch this and implement it and say, we're testing this technology, but really understand in the journey, where is it going to be the most important and the most powerful? That is awesome. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, I see that somebody asked, uh, oh, Anita asked, is there a process where we can nominate to be part of the pilot program? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Give us a call. We'll be more. Yeah, I think the process is reach out to us. Um, Definitely, because we're having different conversations. And then Bonnie's question sort of following on with that, the approximate cost to run a POC. I, I don't have it here on the top of my head. I know that co-investment has been on the table for quite a few of these, especially um, looking at co-investment with then the possibility of, of a broader rollout. So in both of those cases, you know, reach out to us and we can definitely talk about both what the cost is and, and work with the account team on what the cost might be and also what would be good, good um, you know, a good, uh, uh, use case or pilot in some in some cases if the use cases are good enough and and will provide additional information there can be co-innovation capability where we get some funding from our side to make sure that when we develop exactly it yeah becomes a product that others can use yeah, yeah. so three of us had asked about you know sort of the differentiators with digital twin i'm not sure we have enough time to talk about all of the differentiators with what we're doing with digital twin Because it's really going to be not just the technology of doing that, but our ability to aggregate that data together that is required to create the right digital twin, and then our ability to help with the systems that will be connecting to it. Teresa, I don't know if you have an elevator pitch for the differentiator or if that's one of those things we'd love to follow up to go into detail, because they are for sure there. Our expertise lies in the putting of all the pieces together. You know, everybody's got a piece. And in some cases, they're very proud of that piece, but it does a particular thing. What we're trying to do is take those very, very shiny pieces and put them all together into a much more integrated thing. Yeah, we are definitely the integration framework experts of how do you how do you bring all of this together in addition to having that IP that we're bringing it. All right. All right. I think just the final comment. Somebody asked if you could share your PowerPoint deck. On, on yeah, the- I believe we can. Yeah, I don't think there's anything in there we can't share. Oh, and we're about to get whisked out of this room. So thank you, everyone. This was awesome. Thank you so thank much. You. It was great. Great, fun. great questions. Thank Thanks. And thank you to our presenters. Lovely, lovely, um, great. You made data really exciting and interesting. <laughs> So thank you so much, everybody. I guess we have to go back to the main room. I don't know if there's anything uh, happening over there, but go ahead and leave. Yeah, I think they want to do some closing remarks. So um, we could either leave now or we'll be whisked away in 20 seconds. Whisked away. I just feel like Harry Potter. (laughs) Just feel like Harry Potter on the platform. Okay, thank you, everybody. 